Okay, uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, this is uh, joint work with uh, Pedro Rodenas Serrano. He's a graduate student at the University of Alicante. Me, the door. And this paper is about uh, terrorism and human capital at birth. And in particular, we're going to look at the impact of bomb casualties on birth outcomes in Spain, looking at uh, terrorist activity by Euskaditas Catasuna. So, well, it's pretty clear that terrorism is one of today's most important challenges faced by governments. And uh, clearly, if we think about what are the effects of terrorism, we can see basically on destruction of human capital just by killing people and destruction of physical capital by destroying infrastructure. Now, one of the questions, of course, is what is the social cost of terrorism? And when thinking about the social cost of terrorism, about just not, it's not about just quantifying like the economic cost of the destroyed infrastructure, or the, basically the, the value of a statistical life, is more about also subtle effects, including stress and, and anxiety responses. So in particular, there is some evidence out there suggesting like after the London terrorist attacks of 2005, there was a drop in self-reported mental health in, in the UK. This is evidence from Dasman and Fasani. So here, what we're gonna, we're, well, there is, there is obvious one question is, and is why does exposure to terrorism may increase mental distress? So, well, there are plenty of reasons why this could be the case. It could be just because the level of anxiety and fear of being victimized increases. It may reduce the sense of freedom by limitations to behavior, like staying at home instead of like going and having a nice walk around the beach or whatever. Uh, let me just clarify that how actual terrorism translates into individual perceptions and fears possible along these channels that I mentioned, or many others that I don't know, are, and then converting to mental distress is not what we address or we can address in this paper. We do not even estimate the causal effect of terrorism in the area of residents or mental distress of residents, which could be seen as a first stage. What we're going to do here is we're going to estimate a reduced form effect of terrorism during each, and that's important, during each trimester of pregnancy in the areas of mother's residence on birth outcomes. So it's important to take into account that pregnant women are one of the most vulnerable uh, groups to stress responses. Uh, and that's because the fetal environment is largely determined by things that happen uh, basically uh, around. So basically, the macro environment in which the, the mother lives are, is very important, not just about nutrition, but also about, for example, whether she's exposed like, to stressful events. Okay? Uh, this includes lack of food. This includes high stress. And um, well, we know that uh, there is some evidence out there suggesting that women who experience stress early in pregnancy, in particular the, the first trimester of pregnancy, are at an increased risk of having a low birth weight. Now, why do we care about low birth weight? Well, this is one of the, the kind of markers that uh, have been related to worse postnatal outcomes, including mortality, worse educational attainments, worse labor market outcomes, including employability and earnings, and worse adult health status. There is a lot of evidence out there, in particular there is this paper by Black, Devereaux, and Salvanes, um, and, uh, well, basically this paper is about terrorism and birth outcomes in, uh, in Spain. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to look at the effects of an ongoing terrorist conflict. Uh, that's going to be the terrorist activity by ETA on birth outcomes using administrative data. Okay? So the way it's going to work is basically we're going to combine two types of data. We're going to combine the National Registry of Live births. So this includes all live births since 1980 until 2003. And we were stopping at 2003 because in 2004, there was basically a terrorist attack uh, in Madrid, the Madrid bombing uh, of, uh, of Atocha, and we don't want to contaminate our identification strategy with, with this kind of event. And we're going to combine the National Registry of Live Births with the victims of ETA data set, and this has been elaborated by two political scientists, where basically they document each and all of the terrorist attacks of ETA, including uh, casualties. Okay? Like. okay, so which kind of birth outcomes we're going to look at? We're going to look at basically five birth outcomes here. The first one is birth weight, and the second one is just the function of birth weight, so it's low birth weight. And then uh, the thing is that in this literature, uh, Janet Curry and co-authors have realized that depending on which identification strategy you use, uh, you can get very different results. And they suggest to use another type of indicator. In particular, they, they recommend to use normality. What normality means is basically whether there are complications during pregnancy. It's kind of an indicator of complications during pregnancy. Uh, I'm going to use also gender as an outcome because it seems to be the case that uh, males are very vulnerable in utero, more vulnerable than females. 
and we, we want to see whether basically this kind of exposure is so big that basically there's a change in, in the sex ratio given this exposure to terrorism. And then another outcome that we're going to look at is prematurity. Okay? So the identification strategy is going to be uh, very simple. It's going to be just a diff in diff across provinces, 50 geographical regions, and time. And time is going to be capturing both things. It's going to be capture year and trimester. So we're going to have 270, 275 conception month years. So when uh, aren't the terrorist attacks possibly uh, targeted in time, in areas and places where certain other things are happening at the same time? So there is an important point here to make, and it's that be before 1980, the strategy that ETA was following was one of at just targeting the Basque Country. After the 1980, basically, they spread out to the rest of Spain. And in terms of like thinking about predictability of terrorist attacks, we just conduct a simple testing, which basically we look at terrorist attacks today, let's say at time t, how did they predict terrorist attacks at time t plus one in, in different provinces. And it's not so much where they predict other events. Other events. Or, or correlated, you know, suppose they, they, might, they might just target the place where they have bigger growth, for example. So, yes. Uh, I don't think that there is much evidence of there that in Spain that's the case. But one of the things that we're going to look here, and that's very that's going to be important, is to look at another potential source of stress. Let's say unemployment rate in in each region in each trimester of pregnancy, and try to compare what happens. Whether, for example, by controlling for let's say the economic cycle, we obtain different results. That's that's an important point. There is a paper by a, by Alberto Abadie and Garde Sabal that they quantify what's the economic cost of terrorism in the Basque Country. And basically, what they use is just like kind of synthetic cohort method. But that's the that's point that I, I'm going to get back to this, this issue. Sorry, what's, what's yes. Attack here? So Sorry? What's an attack here? Is there active killing? So we're going to do two different things here. One is going to be uh, all casualties. So no matter which type of casualty is. And the other one is going to be bomb casualties. OK? I'm going to present bomb casualties results. OK? So there is an explosion, and people get killed. That's the important point. OK? Uh, so basically, it's going to go from 1 until 20 something. Okay? Yeah. Just a clarification. There's a standard correction in the epidemiology Yes. I think at, at some point we, we use also this measure. Here, for simplicity, I'm, I'm just presenting these, three, these, these five different measures. I think that this is basically accounting its birth weight adjusted by gestational length. No, 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 here not. But I mean, the, the kind of measure I think you're referring to is the birth weight adjusted by gestational length, right? Yes. So here we are just reporting birth weight, and I'm going to report you like prematurity separately. So what is, okay. what is low birth weight? Low birth weight is just one if, if the baby is born with like two kilograms and a half oh. uh, or less, and zero otherwise. Can you elaborate on one question? So all casualties means any kind of casualty? Or only those identified as a terrorist attack? Or? All casualties here are ETA casualties. So these are bomb ca casualties by, by ETA. So but you said you have all casualties and bomb casualties. So. It depends if you're killed in a shooting versus a bomb. Here I'm telling you that I did the analysis with all casualties, including shooting, like uh, bomb casualties, whatever. And I'm going to present here bomb casualties. But this is only ETA. OK, that's the important point. But is there any like, non-terrorist In Spain? Regions? No. Okay. So. Uh, we're going to use like a reduced form analysis exploiting variation in the period of parental exposure. And then, uh, OK, I'm going to try to present something kind of quote unquote semi structural analysis to learn something, uh, if at all it's possible, about the production function of human capital at birth. So there is some previous research about terrorist activity and birth outcomes. And in particular, there is this paper by Ryan Brown on September 11, where he found that there was a reduction in birth weight and an increase in prematurity. <coughs> Now, the issue with September 11 is like it's uh, in comparison to the type of terrorist attacks that we are going to analyze here, is the source of many, many bad things. Uh, it's not just the stress, it's pollution, it's uh, 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 like uh, shocks in resources. Uh, in particular, the paper by Janet Corey and Schwanz, they describe the events of September 11 as an unparalleled environmental disaster, realizing a million tons of toxic dust into lower Manhattan. So, the kind of idea that we think here that we are analyzing is kind of a stress stressful event. Uh, and and the, the reason is that eta-terrorist attacks had, have had negligible effects, if any, on pollution. 
So basically, we're going to try to complement what we know about terrorist activity in Spain in the political arena. So we know that uh, the paper by Montalvo shows that uh, the March 11th attacks changed basically the electoral outcomes, and the paper by Abadie and Gardasabal quantify the kind of the economic impact of uh, terrorist activity in the Basque Country. Okay. So let me just uh, summarize what are going to be the main findings here. So we're going to find that in utero exposure to terrorism early in pregnancy in the first trimester, as measured by the number of bomb casualties, is going to decrease average birth weight. It's going to increase the fraction of low birth weights, and it's going to decrease the fraction of normal babies. Now, yes. Could you give us an, uh, an idea about the size of the effect? Yes, I'm going to discuss the size of the effect. Uh, because, I'm, yeah. I'm going to compare. I'm believing it's big. But... It's not big but it's not big depending on what's the comparison that you're making. So I, I'm going to get back to this point. Uh, these results are pretty robust to controlling for observable characteristics and probably specific trends. It's going to be robust to use date of birth instead of estimated date of conception. It's going to be used to con robust to controlling for unemployment rates during pregnancy. It's going to be used, uh, it's going to be robust to excluding either the Basque country or the safe provinces. And we're going to perform also several falsification tests. We also find that the neutral exposure to terrorism is going to increase Stillbirth uh, define as those fetal deaths after 24 weeks of pregnancy. And we're going to find also that terrorism, if anything, increases live births nine months after. Now, the kind of interpretation that we're going to give to these estimates is that terrorism is kind of a, an acute maternal stressor. And that's sort of consistent with previous work on landmine explosions by Camacho, on September 11 by Brown, and on the Intifada by Mansour Andres. OK, so yes. Uh, we don't have this information. So we compare, compare the so what do you mean longitudinal variation? We don't have information on miscarriages. So, so, but, so yes. Sorry, I cannot hear you. The location. Yes. What's going to? So yes. So the idea is like, what's the, what's the relevant catchment area as well? So do we think that an explosion in Madrid is affecting like those people living in Barcelona or like something happening in Alicante? I'm going to get back to this point. So yes. So we are going to look at migration as well, and we're going to look also like uh, at indirect treatment effects. So what's the impact of an explosion in Madrid? Not just like, so let me put it like that. I'm going to take into account of, if I'm living in Barcelona, what's the impact of an explosion in Barcelona, but what's the impact of an explosion in Alicante as well. So I'm going to just like try to increase my catchment area. So, uh, OK. Uh, this is uh, counterintuitive. Uh, no. Yes, it's counterintuitive. OK, so I'm going to present some data this and descriptive statistics. I'm going to present the main results. I'm going to discuss some threats to, to, to validity and present additional results. I'm going to talk briefly about something more general, the production of child health. And finally, I'm going to talk about the long-term outcomes. That's going to be very, 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 very preliminary work in progress. OK, so in terms of the data set that we're going to use, as I was telling you before, we're going to use the victims of ETA data set, where, where each unit of observation is a victim casualty. And we know if this was like a bomb or it was a shooting. And we have the name of the victim, the region of occurrence, and the date. And we are going to use the National Registry of Live Births. Each observation is live birth. And we have for the newborn date of occurrence, month and year, gender, weight, gestational length, and normality. For the mother, we also have information on province of residence, age, number of birth, marital status, and occupational status. And for the father, if that's the case, we're going to have information on age and occupational status. Like following the literature, we're going to focus on a sample of mothers age 15, 49, are we, and we're going to exclude multiple births. And if we look here, we have these two uh, rows here, where basically what we're saying is like, we have information on conception for 6.5 million of observations, but on date of birth for 9.5 million. Okay? So it's important to see what happens when we compare like, these two approaches in terms of like, defi defining exposure. Okay? Okay, this, this is like the evolution of ETA casualties over time. And this is like pulling all uh, regions in Spain from the first quarter in 1980 until the last quarter of 2003. And what we observe here is like uh, this kind of, like, uh, kind of fluctuations. 
But clearly also what we know, I mean, since 2011, there was like a, a definite sense of fire by ETA. There is no more uh, bomb casualties, no attacks, but there is kind of like a trend over time. But in any case, there is like also fluctuations, okay? Now in terms of like variation across Spain, this is bomb casualties. We have like kind of like the hotspots, like including Barcelona, Madrid, and the Basque Country. If we include all casualties, then this, uh, there is, uh, there's a small change here, so we go from 15 to 60 bomb casualties, and here we go from 60 to 205. We get a bit more of gray. The main idea is like we have a lot of dispersion across Spain, so this involves different regions. It's not just Barcelona or Madrid. Okay. Now, I'm just going to summarize my findings with a graph. So remember, I was telling you that uh, child normality is one of the outcomes that we should look if we have the possibility to look at, and here we are just plotting child normality against bomb casualties in the first trimester of pregnancy. This is for the full sample, okay? And the size of uh, each of these uh, dots, it's basically the number of lifers that we have in each cell, okay? So basically we have like 13,900 cells at, at the province and trimester level. And if we plot child normality against bomb casualties in the first trimester of pregnancy, that's what we find. Now what happens if we just like consider those with at least one casualty, that's what we find. And what happens if we include those with at least 10 casualties? Well, finally, we get this kind of, uh, kind of slope. So uh, relating like child normality is less likely to occur the highest number of bomb casualties in first trimester of pregnancy. This is just descriptive statistics, OK? We have more descriptive statistics here. Bottom line is that we have uh, an, yes? Can you go back? I yep. don't quite understand those, uh, the previous graph. Why the bomb casualties are clustered in early 10th and Oh, so this basically is like uh, they always kill 21. Or well, I remember one of these ones. This was, <laughs> this was 1987. There is one of 21. This was in Barcelona, in uh, Meridiana, was in the Percor. So this was like uh, 1987, uh, 19th of June. But I mean, it's not like, it's basically what it is. I mean, there is no kind of, I mean, here there is, let me put it like that. Unfortunately, there is no measurement error, so uh, that's, that's what it is. Okay, so we have, uh, sorry, how much time do I have? So 36 is the difference that we have here between uh, the average birth weight between places uh, with at least one, one bomb casualty and places with at least no bomb casualty. And of course, this is just like a comparison between 1980 and 2003. Plenty of differences maybe between these places and these other places. This is just like kind of descriptive statistics. So uh, not very kind of interesting thing. The only point to note is like in comparison to other places, like uh, maybe developing countries, the fraction of low birth weights in Spain is very small. It's around 5% or 6%, depending on the region we're looking at. The fraction of normality is between 0.9 and 0.9, and here we have prematurity 0 0.45, 0 0.5, and then we have some differences in terms of mother and pregnancy characteristics, meaning that, of course, we need to control for like difference in the mother characteristics and whether marital status and all this kind of stuff. Okay, so let me, let me move to the kind of uh, identification strategy that we're gonna use. We're gonna estimate regressions of the form of basically the outcome for baby I whose mother was residing in province P at time T. So this means that what we're gonna have here is like a first regressor of the number of casualties in the first trimester of pregnancy, a first regressor of the number of bomb casualties in the second trimester of pregnancy, and a third regressor of the number of casualties in the third trimester of pregnancy, accounting for province fixed effects, time fixed effects, mother characteristics, and also province specific uh, time trends. Yes? Uh, the extensive margin, so like whether or not a bombing happened or not. I'm gonna go back to this point when discussing about nonlinearities. That's 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 gonna be another issue. Okay, and then crucial point here is uh, I'm gonna cluster my standard errors at the province level. So we have 50 provinces. So the next table shows basically the main results. So we have panel A with year, month fixed effects and province fixed effects only. What happens when we include social demographic controls? and what happens when we include province-specific linear time trends. 
So in the first column, we have birth weight in grams. In the second column, we have low birth weight times 1,000. This is standard in the literature because the magnitudes are very small. And if you don't multiply them by 1,000, you start adding plenty of zeros, and this doesn't fit the column. So we have low birth weight normality, gender, and prematurity. Okay. So the first uh, important point to note is like there is not much of a difference if we move from not controlling for social demographic controls or controlling for social demographic controls. All the action is coming when we basically kill all the variation at the let's say the which <laughs> <laughs> when we uh, remove the the variation <laughs> between uh, <laughs> driven by province specific time trends. So basically, this goes from around 0.7 grams by bomb casualty. Here it's basically 0.7 grams, and here we have 0.3 grams. Okay. And in terms of low birth weight, what we have is an increase of, let's say, there were like. So that is evidence. That is evidence of. Targeting specific targeting on specific problems, right? You're showing that the. Well, the question is also like whether, yes, whether these things are, are going to be statistically different or not. So in a sense, I'm removing all this variation. But of course, now I, I'm just identifying out of like, uh, well, basically, uh, I'm not going to repeat the, the same word, but I'm just removing this, uh, this whole, whole variation. Yes, right? For some people, we'll say, like, basically, once you remove all this variation, there is nothing left in your data. So, I mean, so how many years do you have? I have uh, from 1980 to 2003 times 12, t sorry, time, uh, 12 months of conception times uh, 50 provinces. Is that a lot of data? 13,900 observations in terms of cells. Yes, yes. But bomb castle is, is, is a rare ban in Spain. So it's not like bomba bombardings during the Second World War. Or something. To, to, identify, to identify the differential trends yeah. in, the, in the outcome variable, you've got plenty of observations. Fair enough. So to me, the, the, the point I want to make is like even accounting for that, I mean, there's still like something there. Now, the question is, of course, whether these magnitudes are relevant or not, and how do they compare with what we know in the literature about birth outcomes? So the first question would be, well, uh, you show me these, uh, these coefficients, but the question is, can we reject the hypothesis that the coefficients on each trimester are the same? And the answer is mixed. It's uh, yes and no. It depends on the, the, the outcome that we look at. So we, we test this hypothesis for the three previous specifications. For birth weight, the p-value that we get is 0.7. Once we include these other controls, 0.6, and then it goes to 0.13, to, to 0.30. For low birth weight, we always reject the hypothesis that the coefficients are, are the same, no matter whether we are controlling for A, B, or C. And for normality, the same thing. Now, accidentally, it happens, because that's, this is one of the things of the paper that we have presently computed. It happens that these are the two measures that we're going to use in the last part of the paper for kind of the semi-structural part. Now, what about the magnitudes? Well, if we compare the impacts of terrorism on birth weight in Spain and in the US, here, one bomb casualty in the first trimester of pregnancy is associated with has an associated reduction in birth weight of around minus 0.7 to minus 0.3 grams. Brown uh, shows that in the US, this reduction was like uh, due to September 11, was between minus 15 and five, five grams. Here we're talking about one casualty. Here we're talking about 2,600 casualties. So I mean, it's it's kind of like the comparison is, it's just I'm telling you this number because that's what we know about terrorism, okay? But I mean, you need to keep this in mind. Now, if we compare this in terms of like what we know about nutrition and birth weight and uh, the federal nutrition programs in the US, Hillary Hoynes, the Galmon and co-authors show, for example, that if we look at the supplemental nutritional program for women and children, the effect on the average population is around two grams. Once we scale up this among the participants, kind of treatment on the treated, this would be between 18 and 29 grams. Similarly, if we look at the food stamp program, in general, this is around two and five grams. And if we scale up for those who are treated, this would be like 15 to 40 grams. Now the question is like, how do we scale up our effects? Uh, because of course, I'm just saying like, this is exposure to the, this trimester of pregnancy in that particular province. But clearly there's gonna be heterogeneity. Not everyone is gonna be equally likely to be affected by terrorism, okay? 
So, but this is basically, in terms of like the magnitudes, how my uh, estimates compare to what we already know from other programs. OK, so in terms of interpreting my estimates, you need to think about, well, ideally, we would like to measure exposure. We actually are not measuring exposure to terrorism. We are measuring something like intent to exposure to terrorism or something like that. OK, and apart from that, there is a bunch of uh, heterogeneity, not only ones exposed to the same uh, factors, less nutrition, more stress. Uh, well, there are a bunch of other things here. Now, there are many, many, many things that can go wrong with my previous empirical specification. The first one is that uh, we have gestational length that is missing in 32% of cases. But for those, or for all of them, we have date of birth. So one thing that we can check is what happens if we use, instead of uh, date of conception, the date of, of birth. The second thing that we are not accounting for, and this goes back to Costa's point about economic conditions, is what happens if we account for, in some sense, economic conditions. Okay? And we're going to take into account of the role of unemployment, one of the main issues in Spain, in particular during, during this whole period. Uh, now, Joram was asking something about the indirect treatment effects, bef like kind of if there is a terrorist attack in Madrid, how does this compare or how does it affect people living in Barcelona? So we're going to look at, quote unquote, special indirect effects. Uh, there could be like some sort of anticipation effects, and we are going to check whether anticipation effects are plausible, and we're going to perform several falsification tests. In particular, we're going to look at what happens if we use as treatment or intent to exposure to terrorism bomb casualties after birth, and what happens when we randomly, uh, when we randomly allocate bomb casualties uh, in our cells. Uh, there was a question as well about what happens if you just focus on, uh, let's say, one terrorist attack or one bomb casualty against nothing else. So this, this speaks about nonlinearities. There is something else, and that's important, and this is about heterogeneous effects. And these heterogeneous effects can be either by family characteristics, by time period, or by type of region. And we are going to investigate those. And finally, something else that we're going to do is we are going to try to do as best as we can in terms of identifying effects on migration, fertility, and mortality but keeping in mind that here we are not identifying mothers over time, so I cannot play with mother's fixed effects. At least the only thing that we are going to be able to do with migration is to look at population sizes by province and, and, and time. Okay? So if we count backward from date of birth, that's the other kind of approach to measure exposure in this literature. So you don't, you don't have estimated date of conception. What you do is basically you know date of birth and then you can count backwards and basically it is like to count two months to zero backwards, five to three months backwards, and eight to six months backwards. And it is like this is a proxy for exposure in the first trimester. This is a proxy for exposure in the second trimester. And this is a proxy for exposure in the third trimester. If we do that, what we get is that, uh, well, that's a comparison. That's what we did before using date of conception to measure prenatal exposure. That's what we do now to measure date of birth as an, our measure of prenatal exposure. So basically, the coefficient on birth weight, it's still the same. The coefficient on low birth weight decreases, and it's not significant anymore. And in terms of normality, this also decreases by half. And um, well, there is one issue here, though. And the issue is like, by moving from this sample to this sample, the sample size changes. So we need to take into account also what happens if we keep this same sample size, but we change the definition of exposure. Okay. That's what we do in our next uh, slide. So basically, what happens here is consistent with the idea that for those bomb casualties assigned to the first trimester of pregnancy, if anything, there's going to be a lot of measurement error because we're counting backwards and we're not taking into account prematurities. So we are assigning bombs to babies who were not exposed in utero to these bombs. So that's basically what happens when we focus on prenatal exposure using date of birth instead of using prenatal exposure using date of conception. Now, what happens if uh, we include economic conditions, and in particular, unemployment rates in each of the trimesters of pregnancy? Well, what happens here is was kind of astonishing to us, because uh, basically what we get is like the coefficients changing color. Uh, and basically, they are statistically significant everywhere. So when, birth weight is ne when we have the negative coefficient on bomb casualties in the first trimester of pregnancy, that is minus 0.25, here we have that unemployment rate in the first trimester of pregnancy is 0.6 positive. When we have the low birth rate is positive associated with bomb casualties in the first trimester of pregnancy, 
then we find that that employment rate is negatively associated to low birth weight in the first trimester of pregnancy. And similarly with normality. So uh, there is a literature. Working is more, more stressful. Than working is more stressful. <laughs> so, so the policy implication is like, let's, uh, let's uh, keep uh, the employment rate at 100% and let's focus on terrorism. So, uh, OK, so one of the possibilities here, I mean, I'm trying to look at the literature. There is this paper by Adriana Yerasmuni and the Heja. And they, they find that an employment rate during conception, if anything, is a, is a positive, quote unquote, thing for child health. But the problem here is that this does not apply, because this is not an employment rate during conception. This is an employment rate in the first semester of pregnancy. Uh, so to be honest, I, I have no clear interpretation of what's going on here. One could think that it's something like in Spain, when unemployment rate increases, uh, people are happy. Uh, I don't know, to be honest. I don't know what it is. No. No, it So, I mean, another way to think about this type of regressions is like I'm thinking about this thing as, as my instrument, as my instruments, and I'm just estimating some kind of ITT thing. Okay, I'm gonna get back to this point and try to see. Okay, what can we estimate from a production function of child health by using these kind of shocks? That's gonna be kind of yes. The positive things, yes. So the positive things are there. So, OK, now the other issue that can go wrong here is that we're not accounting for spatial indirect effects. So the question being, is the model's province of residence the relevant catchment area for the impact of terrorism on birth outcomes? Or is terrorist activity in neighboring provinces relevant too? So we are going to perform two type of exercise here. We're going to include bomb casualties in neighboring provinces. So these are going to be provinces that are adjacent to the province where, where uh, the mother is, is residing. And we're going to just like kind of a definition like bomb casualties within 300 kilometers. So basically now we have bomb casualties in the first trimester of pregnancy in the province and then bomb casualties in the adjacent uh, province or in a province like 300 kilometers far away in each trimester of pregnancy. So let's see what happens if we control for that. So if we control for that, nothing happens, actually. So basically, we still find that bomb casualties in the first trimester of pregnancy seems to be relevant again, that low birth weight is also affected again, that normality is again. And this, it doesn't matter if we use adjacent provinces or we use bomb casualties within 300 kilometers. So it seems like indirect treatment effects are not driving our previous estimates. Now, it could be the case that maybe in some sense some there could be some kind of anticipation so ideally bomb casualties after birth should not predict birth outcomes if if they happen well uh, they they may affect let's say long-term outcomes and that's going to be an issue for my last slide but for my previous slides in principle bomb casualties should after birth should not predict birth outcomes um, and then what's the other thing that we can do here is what happens if we randomly assign bomb casualties uh, well, of course, we shouldn't find anything. So in this uh, table here, I'm adding this row where basically we have kind of a placebo test, bomb casualties in the first trimester of after birth. And nothing comes out statistically significant, so that's good. It seems like what happens after birth does not explain uh, child health. Uh, another thing that we, we did is basically we collapsed the data at the month year province level. And then we weight it by the number of observations within each cell. So basically, we're going to do exactly the same term in terms of magnitudes. The only thing that is going to change is the standard errors. Alessandro? Uh, so uh, we're going to get basically the same point estimates. And virtually, are going to get the same standard errors. So we're going to test that there is no effect of first trimester of pregnancy. And what we find is like uh, we reject. So uh, there is an effect. Now, what happens if, instead of doing this, we randomly uh, allocate these bombs and we perform the same test? Well, in that case, what we get is like we, we cannot reject the whole hypothesis. So basically, that's, that's basically telling us that there is no, nothing like kind of like related with what's going on. So in principle, this, this would be kind of like the two kind of placebo tests that we have implemented here. OK? Now, the other issue is like maybe there, are, there is some, t some sort of nonlinearity. So we are going to use three measures of, uh, of nonlinearity. Uh, so three measures of exposure to terrorism. The first one is going to be 
there's at least some terrorist attack, so at least one casualty, versus no terrorism at all. Uh, let's define this as medium intense terrorism, at least five casualties versus less than five casualties, and high intense terrorism at less than casualties versus less than 10 casualties. So if we do that, uh, I'm starting by the one with the highest uh, number of bomb casualties. What we find is like one bomb casualty. So if there is like uh, an attack with more than 10 bomb casualties, this is associated with a reduction in birth weight of about 10 grams, or an increase of a low birth weight child of uh, 6 out of 1,000, or 7 out of 1,000. This effect decreases when we decrease the intensity of terrorism. So here we are just redefining the variable of bomb casualties first trimester higher than 5. And this coefficient grows from minus, almost minus 10 to minus 4. And if we go to just one bomb casualty against the rest, there is not much action here. Uh, that's something that we that's that's something that we can check in the data because we have like uh, for example, we have whether they were politicians, whether they were like uh, police forces like Guardia Civil or Policia Nacional or yes, so that's actually something that we can check. That's yeah. Do you know how I mean these small casualties are they like well reported in the media? Uh, yes, but the thing is like by yeah I mean basically we we. I, c I can go back to that point. Uh, this, yeah, that I have a slide with uh, some sort of media attention to terrorism. It's kind of difficult because, uh, yes, uh, the, the, the word terrorism or ETA, or ETA appears several times, and sometimes it's not associated to a terrorist attack. But I can do something about that. I, I, yeah, uh, let me postpone this at this point. OK, so the other thing we were discussing is about uh, the other possibilities, like uh, there, there are just heterogeneous effects. So for example, it could be like the, the Basque country. I mean, it's, it's kind of like uh, there are many other dimensions that make uh, it like a more stressful place. And when there is a terrorist attack, something else happens. So if we exclude the Basque country, we're going to have 47 provinces. Remember that the full sample, it's 50 provinces. And then we also can exclude what we call the safe provinces. So, so these are provinces without any bomb casualty whatsoever. If we do that, there's going to be like 15 remaining provinces. So if we replicate our analysis, with a full sample, excluding the vast country, and excluding the same provinces, well, basically, we get more or less the same kind of uh, magnitudes. So minus 0.278 here, minus 0.3 here, minus 0.35 here. Just a note here, we are uh, excluding 35 provinces. So here we have 15 clusters. So the, the right way to do that is not just clustering at this number of uh, observations. We should do kind of wild bootstrap cluster or something like that, but we haven't done it yet. Uh, yeah. So the second thing is like maybe we have heterogeneous effects by time period. And in particular, uh, what we did here is kind of a, we split the sample in, in, in three different periods. So the first one was like 1985, 1988. And this is not chosen at random, because in 1987 is when there was this highest peak in the number of etabomb casualties, in part driven by the attack uh, in, in Barcelona in, uh, in uh, 19th June of 1987. Uh, and then we have 1980, 1984, 1989-2003. And these are similar periods in terms of peaks. So if we do that, uh, we get kind of like, uh, for this period, 1985-1988, we get more or less the kind of similar results in terms of bomb casualties in the first trimester of pregnancy. Here, we have even higher, stronger effects. But this is just like to show you that basically the kind of main results that we have here are not just driven by some kind of specific period in the data. OK. Now, remember I was mentioning before that maybe also we have heterogeneous effects by family characteristics. And in particular, we can think that being exposed to a terrorist attack differs by whether the mother is, uh, let's say, has a partner that is uh, a police uh, or like that works for the armed forces. Well, we don't have exactly this level of accuracy in our data. We just have like nine occupational categories. And one of them is armed forces. So uh, you can think like armed forces also include Guardia Civil, because actually it's kind of a military police. So uh, the question here is whether we can think that these uh, mothers whose partners are in the armed forces are kind of react 
worse to these kind of terrorist attacks. Of course, this would be like kind of like a heterogeneous effect. The alternative would be like those who marry this type of people have different attitudes towards risk. So we don't know what's gonna what's gonna happen. So that's an empirical question. The only important issue to keep in mind is that we just have one percent of uh, of the total of observations for this group of of women. If we do that, we have that uh, for the full sample. Uh, this would be the full sample without non -arm, without, without armed forces. So almost six million of observations versus 80,000 observations, the coefficients are basically the same. So they are not driven by women whose partners are in the armed forces. And if anything, the effects for those who are, whose partners are in the armed forces are higher. This coefficient is like six times higher than this coefficient. We don't have enough, enough power to detect that. But at least it's clear to us that it's not driven, our results are not driven by those mothers whose uh, partners are in the armed forces. So what happens with this one when they treat all casualties instead of bomb casualties? Because most of the non-bomb casualties This one. Are, yes, were well, selective, selective killings of people in the... In the so I, I need to check that. Uh, that's, that's, that's a good point. I need to check that. So... Um, Selection effects. So, uh, well, it could be that uh, there is some sort of migration that we are not capturing here. So, in particular, it could happen that the higher the level of terrorist activity in a region at time t minus one, the lower the population size in that region at time t, and this could interfere here because we are we are not uh, we cannot follow mothers over time. Um, it could also be like fertility is changing, and we don't know exactly what's what's the direction because the, the cost of outdoor activities increases with terrorism. But on the other hand, maybe fertility is lower because of people are getting more stress. So it's not clear what's going to be the impact on fertility. In terms of mortality, we're going to look at the large, uh, at whether there is a larger number of fetal deaths. And there is a lot of evidence linking like a kind of uh, stress with uh, the, pa the pathophysiology of stillbirths. So it's important to look at that. Which kind of data we're going to use here? We're going to use population size because we, we cannot follow mothers in year T in province P. We're going to use natality files on live births, so what we were doing before. And we are going to also look at the mortality files. And that's, that's basically the regression looking at whether population changes because of terrorist activity. And it's clear that population changes because of unemployment rate. So unemployment rate last year at this province is uh, affecting the, the fraction of, uh, of women, the number of women in uh, the, the age range 25-54 and the number of men in, the, in this age range as well. But bomb casualties is not having any effect. So this seems to be suggesting that migration doesn't seem to be kind of a very important point here. We also did some, some analysis in terms of stillbirths and live births. Just let me tell you that in terms of live births, what we find is like bomb casualties during conception. And basically, this is kind of a proxy. So what we're doing is like the trimester before the first trimester of pregnancy. So bomb casualties during the, the first trimester, so during the, first, during the trimester before the first trimester of pregnancy is positively associated with live births, but unemployment is negatively associated with live births. Uh, and let me, just, uh, let me just move to the last part of the Yes. These are fetal deaths after the 24 weeks of gestation. With the lifers? Yeah. So, uh, so basically, for this one, what I was thinking of is kind of a, the opportunity cost of time of outdoor activities increases. There is a paper by Alfredo Burlando uh, showing like uh, what happens when there is like basically uh, a shutdown in terms of electricity in, a, in an island. And basically, he shows like after nine months, there is an increase in fertility. Right, like snow days. So you're saying terrorism makes people stay home. Yes, that, that, that's basically. But I mean, I'm just telling you what is there. So I, I, I'm telling you that there are potential explanations. So I'm just telling you that each time that you give an interpretation to my previous coefficients, you need to take into account that there could be some selection going on in terms of who survives and who dies. That's, that's the whole point. I don't, I don't want to make a big fuss of all these coefficients here. Yeah, it's interesting because like most, in most cases, you think the selection effect would be the opposite, that some children yeah. miscarry. And especially if you're saying there's a gender effect, the gender effect is through miscarriage. And so you would yep. think that you know, only the strong would survive. Yep. Yes, that's a good point. Okay, so let let me uh, Wait, nine minutes. 
let me uh, finish with a kind of a digression. So, so far I have been thinking about shocks affecting maternal inputs, but the thing is like we do not observe maternal inputs, so this kind of data is good because it's administrative data and we have all live births and we have a lot of observations, so we have a lot of statistical power. But it's bad because we don't have smoking behavior, we don't have drinking behavior, we don't have antenatal visits, so all these things is missing. Uh, but um, the question is like without all this, can we still identify something uh, about the production of child health? So uh, that's going to be a very rudimentary way of thinking about child health. But uh, so suppose that we can classify babies as being healthy, H1, or unhealthy, H0. And that, each, that H is just a function of several of observable inputs. And we denote these uh, this, uh, several inputs as a vector X, which are unobservable to the econometrician. And the ones that are unobservable to the econometrician are eta. Okay? So let's assume that the production of child health is additively separable in the things that we call x and these things that we do not observe. And on top of that, the f is a smooth function and uh, this eta parameter has mean, uh, eta uh, error term has a mean zero. Let's also assume that uh, eta is mean independent of x. So uh, basically, if we make this uh, kind of two assumptions, that would be very easy because then we can have like exact identification. So under assumptions one and two, we can just estimate the production function of child health non-parametrically and then we can recover the marginal rate of setting and substitution of inputs between, let's say, uh, smoking and drinking. But we, we do not observe that, actually. So, um, so the question is, like, actually, in the data, this, would just b this boils down to just estimate, well, you can do it non-parametrically, or you just can just run a regression of h on x1 and x2, and h on x1 and x2, and then the coefficients on x1 and the coefficient on x2 is going to give you this ratio. Okay? That's just point identified. OK, now, in reality, reality is much more complex. And, and child health, if it's anything, something multidimensional. So suppose that we have multiple dimensions of child health. In particular, remember, I was telling you before that there we can think about two dimensions. We can think about low birth weight and normality. So we are going to have H1 and we are going to have H2. And suppose, on top of that, that assumption H tells us that each of these measures is related to the true underlying health in such a way. OK, so we have this kind of function that is continuous, uh, and we make the heroic assumption that this thing here is a strong separable. Okay? So if that's the case, well, you know what's going to happen. Uh, we're going to be able to over-identify, basically, the marginal rate of technical substitution between x1 and x2. Because we can do this for x1, and we can do this for x2, for h1, and for h2. So we just have two ratios, and we can test whether these two ratios are the same. Now, the problem is that we don't observe x. So the thing is, like, what we can do? OK, so now we need to say, well, suppose that we have two inputs and two types of shocks. And on top of that, that's the function that we're thinking of. If that's the case, then we can over-identify something. But this something is kind of a messy expression. And what actually this means is that if we can identify something, that's going to be a mixture of, let's say, behavioral and biological uh, factors. Now, what happens if we try to estimate that in the data? Well, actually, we can try to estimate that in the data. Uh, so think about this as flipping it in terms of empl uh, employment rate, 1 minus this thing. So this, this is going to be negative, and that's going to be negative, and that's going to be negative. So that, that's going to be positive. Okay? But uh, is it possible to recover the marginal rate of tangle substitution between these types of shocks? Uh, now the question is whether we can infer something about what's going to be the impact on each of these other inputs. That, of course, depends on the type of data that we have. So what is the interpretation of this coefficient? What is the interpretation of this coefficient? So if this was positive, that it's not would be the, the marginal rate of technical substitution between a shock in terrorism and a shock in uh, unemployment. Well, in that case, it would be a shock in employment and a shock in terrorism. So if you were the policymaker and you wanted to decide where to allocate the money, you need to trade off like, between, like, let's say, unemployment subsidies or like, putting more police force or something like that. The bad thing, of course, is that we have that unemployment is positive. So basically, the solution to this problem would be just like, forget about, uh, so increase unemployment and just like concentrate on bomb casualties. But the kind of idea still is there. OK? So unfortunate. Well, not, let me not qualify what's this, the coefficient of this magnitude. The kind of procedure would be like this. So whether we can find other type of shocks here, that's an open issue. OK, so we are working now on, on, on f like uh, looking at long-term outcomes. So that's very preliminary. And this is data from income coming from the Spanish census. And what we have found so far is that, uh, if anything, I mean, here we need to stop at uh, 1986. So this is people born between 1980 
and 1986, because we want to focus on people aged at least 25 in 2010, okay? So what we're finding here is like those people who were in utero uh, in the first, uh, who were, were, while in utero, were exposed to a casualty in the first trimester of pregnancy are less likely to be high school graduates and more likely to be married, okay? That's, that's what, what it's there. <laughs> this is, that's what it's there. Uh, <laughs> and that's basically very preliminary. That's, that's because if you, if you don't go to university, you must be more likely to marry your Yeah, so basically, basically that's, that's, mechani that's ca combined, almost mechanically. <laughs> In neutral, exposure to terrorism affects birth outcomes, birth width, low birth width, and normality. It seems that the stress early in pregnancy could be the explanation because uh, it seems that the literature suggests that the stress is more important in the first trimester while nutrition is more important in the third one. That would be consistent with previous research on armed conflict, on homicides and terrorism, and on other sources of acute maternal stress like earthquakes or economic collapses. However, uh, we do not observe stress or any behavioral maternal response to it, such as whether women smoke more or do less exercise when exposed to bomb casualty. I think that, that would be nice to to try to fit this data into the last part of the paper where we have like this kind of decomposition and try to learn more about the behavioral responses and how they interact with these biological kind of uh, mechanisms. It seems that there is some, also there is some evidence about negative effects on long-term outcomes. That's preliminary work. And currently we're working on the effects of IDA terrorism in the UK. Um, and that's, that's all, thank you. So uh, you mean like the, 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 the so basically the health sector, yes. I think that basically, I think that basically this is one of the mechanisms that uh, is behind something that we observe in Madrid, but that's very preliminary. So in, in the Madrid uh, March 11 bombing uh, train attacks, this was like a massive attack and basically hospitals were collapsed. There is something there, not here. I, I don't think that here there is much that we, we can think of. You don't need much. No, but if that's true, so. that you should see an increase in okay. all kinds of deaths, no? in like not just birth, but maybe elderly I, as I well. That could be like a kind of a placebo. So looking at other, other deaths, so basically. I'm not sure that you would expect exactly the same impact for everyone. No, 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 no. But I mean, no. Well, we're no I mean, young and old, maybe we're not. Well, I don't well, know. Well, I think that's the, that's the reason why you expect that. <laughs> I will need to check, Alessandro. <coughs>